In Toronto's downtown core, at the intersection of Front Street and Spadina, lies one of the most exciting mixed-use developments in the city. It's called The Well. The Well consists of seven towers and mixed-use buildings, totaling more than 3 million square feet of office, retail, and residential space. I've personally been there a few times, and I really love what this whole site has going on. From the beautiful restaurants 38 stories up, offering great views of the city, to the outdoor mall vibes at the lower levels. It's a really great addition to Toronto. But what really makes this development interesting is what also gives it its name, the giant hole at the bottom of the building. On the seventh underground parking level of the well, there is a 15 meter wide and 45 meter deep hole that serves as a storage tank for more than 7.6 million liters of water. That's enough water to fill 2.8 Olympic sized swimming pools. This tank actually forms one key component of an expansive network of pipes that connects over 150 buildings throughout Toronto to the district cooling and district heating systems. To understand the purpose of this well, we need to first understand what this district cooling and district heating system actually is. By definition, a district energy system is used to centralize the production of cooling or heating for a neighborhood or community. So instead of each building in the neighborhood having its own heating or cooling plant, it's done at a central location and that energy is then distributed to each building in the network. In Toronto, this system is operated by N-Wave and is the largest deep lake water cooling system in the world. It leverages the geographic position of Toronto next to Lake Ontario to help with the city's cooling energy demands. Lake Ontario is 244 meters at its deepest. It's deep enough that the water tends to form layers along its depth based on temperature. This process is called thermal stratification. If you go deep enough in the lake, the water stays at a constant 4 degrees Celsius throughout the year. This constant water temperature is used twofold in Toronto, both to supply the city's drinking water and to provide air conditioning for buildings downtown. Here's how the Deep Lake water cooling system actually works. There are three parallel, high-density polyethylene pipes below Lake Ontario, each being around 600 millimeters in diameter and 5.6 kilometers long. These pipes reach down to a depth of 85 meters below the surface of the lake to reach the cool water below. These pipes intake the cold water from the lake and bring it to the Toronto Island water treatment plant, where it's treated to potable water quality, meaning you can drink it. The water then flows to the John Street pumping station. By the time the water reaches the station, it's at a temperature of approximately 4.7 degrees Celsius. If you've ever taken a shower in cold water, you know that four degrees is pretty cold. So why don't we use this cold water to cool our buildings in the summer instead? This is exactly what we do in Toronto. From here, the water enters a series of heat exchangers to transfer energy from the N-Wave district cooling loop, which raises its temperature to 12.5 degrees Celsius. This warmer water is then pumped to the city of Toronto's drinking water system. Not to go on a tangent here, but it might be good to know what a heat exchanger is before we move forward. As the name suggests, heat exchangers are used to exchange energy from two streams of liquid at different temperatures. So you have a hot fluid entering one side and a cold fluid entering the other side. These fluids will exchange heat inside of the heat exchanger without ever mixing with each other, preventing any cross-contamination. The energy exchange between the two fluids is a function of the entering and leaving temperatures and the individual flow rates of each fluid. Now with that out of the way, let's get back to the City of Toronto's Deep Lake Water Cooling System. On the flip side of the drinking water heat exchanger is the district cooling system. So to summarize, we have cold water from Lake Ontario on one side, and we have another stream of water that will be used to cool some buildings on the other side. Let's call this the cooling water stream. Before entering the heat exchangers, the cooling water is at a temperature of 13.1 degrees Celsius. After leaving the heat exchangers, the water is now at a nice and chill temperature of 5 degrees Celsius. And now looking back, we can see that reducing the temperature from 13.1 to 5 degrees Celsius was done purely through heat exchange with deep lake water. That is essentially free cooling without putting much external energy aside from pumping the water. This would otherwise have to be done using chillers, which would consume a lot of energy. But we're not done yet. This cooling water is then pumped to another station where it's cooled down further using chillers to a temperature of 3.3 degrees Celsius. So the remaining 1.7 degrees was of course done through mechanical means using chillers which means electricity. But you might be wondering how all of this relates to the well at the well. So let's get to that part. As I mentioned before, the cooling water that comes out of the deep lake water cooling process is at 3.3 degrees Celsius, 
which is a perfect temperature to be used to cool buildings. Usually, large commercial buildings will have their own chilled water plants, including chillers and cooling towers. These are a common sight across all cities in North America. However, any building connected to this district cooling system enjoys the benefit of not having to leave space for these chillers and cooling towers. This frees up valuable real estate that can then be used for other more useful things. The same principle is applied to district heating systems as well. N-Wave operates both the district cooling system and the district heating system. The well is one of the buildings that's connected to both of these systems, meaning that in the summer, cold water is pumped through fan coil units located throughout the building that essentially blow air over chilled water coils to cool the air. In the winter, hot water is used in the same manner to heat the building instead. So that being said, there's a mechanical room at the parking level of the well where heat exchangers, similar to what I described earlier, transfer heat to and from the N-Wave chilled water and hot water systems to the building's chilled water and hot water systems. This is essentially how all buildings connected to the district energy systems operate. What makes the well unique, however, is that the well also has a thermal energy storage system. You see, for a typical building, the peak cooling loads might occur during a summer afternoon when the sun is out, and the peak heating load might occur in a cold winter evening. And these loads might not necessarily coincide with the times at which power is at its cheapest. The well combats this phenomenon by acting as a thermal battery. The battery itself is a single large vertical tank filled with a specialized high efficiency fluid called SoCool. SoCool stays liquid below zero degrees Celsius, so it's very efficient for cooling storage. So during off-peak times, when power is cheaper, the well charges itself with hot fluid in the winter and cold fluid in the summer. Then during peak hours, it discharges itself to release some of the load from the normal district cooling and heating system. At the risk of getting too technical, I'm gonna go over some schematics of the system while it's charging and discharging in the summer. I think they paint a very good picture of how the well works. As you can see in the schematic, the well storage tank here is on the left. On the right, we have two heat exchangers. The top heat exchanger is the cooling heat exchanger connected to the cold water district piping. On the bottom, we have the heating heat exchanger connected to the hot water district piping. In the middle, we have the evaporator and condensers, which make up the chilled water plant used to reduce the temperature of the fluid passing through them. The arrows here indicate the direction of flow. Let's look at cooling first and let's look at the charging during the cooling period. Starting from the thermal storage tank, let's go in the direction of fluid movement. You can see that we have around 12 degrees Celsius fluid going to the condenser and leaving at a higher temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. This fluid then reaches the heat exchanger where it drops its temperature to 6.7 degrees Celsius. The fluid then goes through the evaporator, which further drops its temperature to around minus one degrees Celsius before finally entering the thermal storage tank. Now, when we're at peak cooling load and need to discharge the tank, the fluid moves in the opposite direction. You can see through the X indicators on the schematic that in this mode, the fluid bypasses both the condenser and the evaporators. The cold minus one degree fluid goes straight from the thermal storage tank into the heat exchanger, where it absorbs heat from the district energy piping and enters the thermal tank again at 12 degrees Celsius. So essentially, when the system is charging, you're using that cheap off-peak electricity to run the chillers to store cold water inside of the thermal tank. And when the system is discharging, you're bypassing the chillers so you're not using electricity because electricity is expensive at this time. During peak hours, you're instead using that stored energy inside of the tank to then cool the building and provide cooling to the district energy plant. Pretty clever. Heating works in much the same way. During charging, you can see that the water at 54 degrees Celsius leaves the thermal storage tank and its temperature is raised to 85 degrees Celsius using the heat exchanger, after which it's stored again in the tank. During discharging, the flow is in the opposite direction. Here, 85 degrees Celsius fluid leaves the storage tank and arrives back at 54 degrees Celsius after exchanging heat with the district heating system. So in summary, during charging, you're storing hot water in the tank and during discharging, you're using that hot water to then heat up a second stream of water that's gonna be used then to heat up the building. Using the storage tank, the well is able to offload some of the peak heating and cooling loads from the district energy system to the off-peak periods, saving energy and money. For example, let's look at this graph from N-Wave 
looking at the performance of the well storage system. In this graph, we have the time of day in the x-axis and the system demand in tons on the y-axis. Tons is a unit of measurement used in the industry used to represent cooling loads. One ton is approximately three and a half kilowatts. The orange bars in this graph are the cooling load provided by the normal district cooling system. The green bars represent the energy being stored inside of the well, and the blue bars represent the energy that's provided by discharging the well. You can see that from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., the system is being charged. This period of time is off-peak, so the energy is cheaper during this time. From 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., you can see that the thermal storage tank is discharging and providing some cooling for the system. This is during peak hours. By discharging during this time, you've essentially moved the cost that it takes to cool the building from peak hours to off-peak hours. So this is not only cheaper, but it reduces the overall load on the power grid of the city of Toronto. So it really is a win-win for everyone. So the next time you're in Toronto, I encourage you to check out the well. I really think it's a really cool building and I hope knowing a little bit about the technical background of this stuff will help you appreciate it even more. Thanks for watching and please subscribe for more engineering and infrastructure content. Thank you.